Good morning, everyone. We're grateful that you joined us today, and we're grateful for your partnership. And speaking on behalf of everyone at Horizon, we hope that you and your families are all well. Today, we're going to take a closer look at what transpired in the, the second quarter. And, and even more importantly, uh, we're going to want to help you gain a better understanding of what the future may have in store. Um, let's face it, there's a lot of noise out there. News cycles faster than anything that I've ever seen. So, so our goal today is to, one, help you make sense of it all. Two, better understand the issues we believe are likely to move markets in the second half of the year. And then three, gain an understanding of the implications from uh, a planning perspective. My name is John Drozel, and I have joining me today uh, our CEO, Scott Lad CIO, Scott Ladner, and our senior analyst, Austin Fitch. Welcome, guys. Hey, thanks, John. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Austin, I know you and your team have talked a lot about how challenging this environment has been for investors and how difficult it's been to see around the next corner. What do you think about that? Yeah, John, I, I think that's absolutely right in regards to what we're talking about on the investment management team here at Horizon. And, and I think you brought up a great point in that the, the first six months of this year uh, have been unprecedented, I think is probably the, the easiest way to put it, both from a, a market perspective, but also just from a personal daily life perspective. Um, and, and I think what I would tell you is what we're focused on here at Horizon is looking forward, trying to figure out what, what's coming, uh, what's going to affect the markets, what's going to affect portfolios as we head into the latter half of this year. And, and we've really boiled it down to, to four main issues uh, that we do think will influence the second half of 2020. And, and as you mentioned, we're also going to talk about how those issues will impact financial planners as they solve for uh, those, their clients' unique uh, circumstances. So as you can see here, the, the four issues, obviously one being the virus, uh, we will for sure talk about that. We'll talk about the consumer. Uh, it's been pretty, pretty interesting to see the resiliency of the U.S. consumer. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the stimulus. Uh, I think it's it's fair to say that uh, the speed and magnitude with which we've seen stimulus stimulus enter the economy over the last few months ha has been really amazing. Uh, and then finally, we will touch on the election because that, that's something that we know is on everyone's mind and, and will absolutely um, gather more and more attention as we head into the second half of this year. So with that being said, Let's dive right in and really talking about the virus first and foremost. Uh, Scott, maybe I'll toss it to you. I think it's fair to say that some of the data that we were looking at even three months ago has changed around the virus. We think that the markets may be paying attention to different sets of data today than they were uh, here recently. Hey, awesome. Yeah, I, I, that's absolutely right. Look, I mean, the, the headlines that we see in the news every day are about new cases. And obviously, new cases matter because they're, they're sort of the germination point for a lot of the other issues that, that we are tracking with respect to this virus. Um, but they're not the only thing that matters. Uh, you know, the, the thing that is really impacting consumer behavior, uh, in, in our opinion, and the data we think will support some of this, is actually the mortality rate associated with this virus um, and to kind of how scared people are. Because, because essentially, if, you know, if, if this is something where you get sick, um, but you, you, you feel in your, in your heart of hearts that you really have no chance to actually die from it, you may be sick for a bit, that's going to lead to a very different set of activity or a very different set of consumer behavior um, than if you're sort of, you know, mortally afraid of death if you, if you contract the disease. So while new cases matter, we don't think they're the, they're the, the most important metric. The thing that we're really watching most closely, um, at least with respect to the virus, is, is actually the mortality rate, that, you know, like who is getting sick and, and, how, and how are they dealing with the sickness. Scott, I think that's a great point that kind of segues into what we'll talk about next in regards to just how fast things change and, and the fluid environment that we live in from, uh, again, from a day-to-day -day life, but also from a market perspective. And I think the, the data that we were just looking at, you mentioned new case data, uh, the mortality rate data that, that's coming out. We're getting that data on a daily basis, and, and I think the frequency of data in today's environment is as important in some cases as the, the data itself sometimes. And so maybe talk us through what we're seeing here on this page, but also this idea of using higher frequency data. It's really the only way to navigate the environment right now that we're in. Um, you know, look, the, 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 this is not a period of time through which you can look at quarterly release data. Like, like GDP when it comes out for the second quarter, 
is it going to be the, you know, like old news, like everybody knows it. Um, so the, the things that we're really watching for uh, on, on this virus to really be able to na navigate some of these markets is the, the higher frequency activity data, data that, we're, that we're getting uh, from any number of sources. Um, and so, you know, there, there are three examples on, the sc on your screen right now, um, you know, having to do with, uh, you know, either, either businesses that are open or employee hours or mobility. You can also look at, you know, restaurant reservations and flight activity data and, T you know, the number of passengers through TSA checkpoints. There's, there's a slew of, of information. Um, but these are all kind of pointing in the same general direction that, you know, that we're, we're certainly, you know, in terms of activity, in terms of economic activity, um, you know, the, the U.S. is, uh, you know, the US, U.S. is certainly off the bottom, um, but, it, but it does appear over the last week or two that, you know, to, towards the end of the, of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter, that the pace of, of acceleration and activity has started to slow down and maybe even stall out. Uh, this is something that we're watching with a lot of interest, uh, but, but, but it's, you know, that, that it, it is yet to be determined how, how it will end up playing out. But certainly these high, these high frequency activity data, we do, do believe are probably the most important thing to be looking at on a day-to-day -day basis in order to assess uh, the impact of the virus on markets and on the, and on the economy, which is ultimately what, at least in this room, we're, we're, we care about right now. And, and Scott, you, you mentioned this idea that, that we're back to about 70, 75% of maybe where we were pre-COVID. And, and I think it's important to highlight uh, some of the headline data that we see, right, where airlines, for example, or, or hotel reservations are still 20, 30, 40 percent of where they were. Is it fair to say that uh, there's, depending on the segment of the economy or the, the sector, if you will, uh, there are going to be differences, but, but the 70 percent number is generally speaking what we see and believe around the economy as a whole? Yeah, that's right. And look, I don't think it should be expected that the economy is going to come back after this in exactly the same format that it entered it. Um, you know, like the, the, these, these types of shocks, these types of, of, of episodes change the way consumers behave. It changes the way economies work. It changes the sort of the interactions between the different players in, in, in economies. So, you know, we shouldn't expect, um, for instance, like, like after, the, after the housing crash, like housing didn't come back exactly the same way. And after this uh, kind, of, kind of, you know, certainly a travel and leisure sort of crash, we shouldn't really expect the travel and leisure, and leisure sectors to come back in exactly the same way as, as, as they existed before. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, this, this, you know, these systems are built on creative destruction, and 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 this is, you know, just because we don't get uh, airline traffic back to pre-COVID levels anytime in the next 12 to 24 months, doesn't mean that the, that the rest of the economy can't can't flourish. And Scott, that's a great point, and and I think you highlighted this this idea of the consumer, and I, I think it's really important to look at consumer in the consumer in regards to their their really their outlook. Uh, and, and I think this chart specifically, and I know you'll talk us through what exactly we're looking at, but I, I think it's fair to say that the consumer through the last probably six or so months has been extremely resilient, in, in some cases surprisingly so. So maybe talk us through that, but then also talk us through what that means from a, a market or a portfolio standpoint. Yeah, look, I mean, this, if you want a picture of uh, uh, resiliency, um, it, it is this. Um, you know, this. This graph depicts the difference between what people think about the future versus their current situation. And you know, the, the upshot is that, that people feel much better about the future than they, than they do about their own current situation, um, which probably resonates with how you and many of your clients are feeling as well. It certainly resonates uh, with, 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 with how I'm feeling. Um, but you know, so, so the, the, you know, the upshot of that is nobody's expecting this to be a super long-term problem or a super long-term shutdown. Um, what, what folks are thinking is this, is this is somewhat of a temporary kind of bump on the road, that at some point it will be over and the future will be better. And, that is, and, that is, and that's important because it's going to drive consumer behavior. It's going to drive spending patterns. It's going to drive savings patterns. It's going to drive investment patterns. You know, what, what we don't want to see is people starting to have a dour outlook on the future. Uh, we have certainly not detected any of that thus far, but it's something we're watching. Uh, but it does give us, you know, it does, it does give us kind of a ray of hope uh, looking out that people, people do expect uh, the future to be, to be pretty bright. Yeah, and, and Scott, you mentioned this idea of a, a temporary event, and, and I think this, this next set of charts maybe does a really good job of, of highlighting uh, just how temporary maybe it, it even was from a, a consumer standpoint. Uh, maybe explain to us what we're looking at here and, and then talk through, again, this idea of personal finances and your outlook around those. How, how does that impact what we're looking at? It, it has a lot to do. Again, we're talking a lot about the consumer because the consumer matters a lot to the U.S. economy, obviously. Um, but you know, they're, they're, this is this, these are charts. Uh, what I'm is just a kind of a, a more recent version of the of the data series. But this is really 
uh, you know, how many, it's a daily survey that, that, that's run by uh, one of our research partners, a firm called Cornerstone Macro. And when the, when the number is positive, this, this is a daily survey of folks who are saying, you know, how do you, how do you think about your own personal finances? And if it's a positive number, like 50, uh, you know, as, as it was kind of before we hit this crisis, that means that there are 50% more people uh, that, that are saying that they have good, fun, you know, they have a good opinion about their personal finances relative to a, a bad opinion about their personal finances. Uh, that's, that's pretty strong. Um, so the, the two things that I want to, to you to take out of this graph, though, um, is one, look at where we entered this, this, this period of trouble. Like, this is an incredibly strong period for the U.S. consumer. Um, and, and, it's, and, and, you know, so we came into this troubling period uh, from, a, from, from, a, from a position of strength. Um, very different than how we came into the great financial crisis. Very different than how we came into the Internet bubble. Um, and, and so you know, the, the fact that we came into this and with such a period of strength um, is, is actually, we think, fairly important. The other thing to, to notice is how quickly we snapped back. Uh, and, this, and there's certainly some stimulus uh, information in this. I mean, you know, I don't think that people would be thinking their own personal finances were, were you know, kind of back to pre-COVID levels as quickly uh, as, they, as, they, as they've gotten back without, without the impact of stimulus. But look, stimulus is a reality. So, you know, we can't sit here and discount it and say, well, but for stimulus, people would be really thinking terrible about themselves. Like, that may be the case, but that's not reality. That's an alternate reality. Uh, and, and the one that we actually live in is, is one where stimulus is important. It's been big. It's been helpful. It's been very accurate. Uh, and so, you know, so, so right now, like the, the consumer is feeling pretty good about themselves uh, and we, and we do, you know, we're going to talk about stimulus later on, but we, you know, there is probably another package coming. Scott, let, let me pause here for a second. And, and I think one thing to note, especially as you look at the longer term chart here is, is just how much uh, this has improved over the last call it decade. So coming off the bottom, coming out of the great financial crisis, uh, you have a consumer that continues to feel better and better about their personal finances. Maybe, maybe let's take a step back and, and think about really what has driven that um, and, and why do we think that's important, especially as, as we have gone through this event over the last six months. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's fascinating what you see in the data is, is if, you look, if you look at the last decade. Um, you know, typically in expansions, uh, you have consumers levering up. You basically have, you know, you have people adding debt, uh, spending more. Uh, that, that, is, that is kind of the typical and saving less. Um, that's the typical consumer behavior behind every expansion in, in U.S. history over the last 100 years, except for the last one. Uh, in the last one, what we, what we saw was actually consumers paying down debt. Uh, we saw people, consumers deleveraging. So, so a massive deleveraging in the household sector. Now, corporations and governments were levering up. You know, they were adding debt. But from a consumer standpoint, from a personal standpoint, people were paying down debt. So they entered this place uh, you know, with, with, with not nearly the debt load that they had coming into the great financial crisis or any of these other recessions over the last 100 years. They came in place like with pretty good balance sheets, with pretty good personal balance sheets. Um, you know, don't think that doesn't matter. It, it, that, that has a lot to do with how folks are seeing themselves in terms of their own personal financial situation. They're not saddled with a whole lot of household debt. Yeah, so Scott, we talk about the the individual maybe not being saddled saddled with a, a lot of debt, and, and maybe then uh, flip that and, and let's talk about the government um, because I, I think as you can see in this chart, just the total assets on the Federal Reserve balance sheet has, I mean, uh, again, almost uh, almost grown by three trillion dollars over the last three months. Maybe talk us through exactly what we're looking at here. Uh, but also what that means from a market perspective. I know we've talked about the, the Fed support. What does that mean for, for the market, but also the, the portfolios? You know, when, also when, when I was thinking about, when we were thinking about how to depict um, the, the ferocity with which uh, global central banks and especially the Fed dealt with this pandemic, um, I was, you know, one, one thought occurred is like, well, so they added, you know, we know they add $3 trillion to the balance sheet in about a quarter. I wonder how long that took them to add $3 trillion to the balance sheet after the great financial crisis. It was over five years. So they, they did in three months what, the, what took them over five years to do um, after, the, after the last worst depressions or, you know, the crisis since the Great Depression. Um, if that doesn't tell you how seriously uh, global, global central banks are taking this episode, I don't, I don't know what would. Um, but, but it does show a lot of intent and a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of understanding for the importance of not only, uh, you know, basically for the importance of investment grade spreads, uh, to uh, to the functioning of financial markets and to and to consumer behavior and to the, the you know central banks' mandates of full employment uh, and and growth and so you know the, just the fact that they're acting with this much speed and ferocity 
uh, should show us uh, their hand. It should show us what the reaction function looks like when, when they are faced with some potentially very destabilizing events in financial markets. Yeah, and, and Scott, you mentioned this idea of a, a Fed mandate, and, and I think, um, but would it be fair to say that the, the Fed activity over the last three months has absolutely been at least one of the reasons that we've seen some of the, the bounce back in markets that, that we have, a, a market that was down 35 percent uh, in, you know, from peak to trough earlier this year has almost fully recovered. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that, that the Fed stimulus has, has helped that and served as a tailwind. Yeah, look, uh, money's got to go somewhere. Uh, you, you can't put $3 trillion into a system uh, and have it get to the real economy overnight. Um, and so, the, you know, one intermediate stop for that money on, on, on the way to, to, to everyday Americans or the, or the way to the, to the general economy uh, is the financial markets. And, 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 you know, we, I think we've seen a, a pretty clear impact of, of, you know, of the stimulus money, of, of, of the increase in the Fed's balance sheet on financial markets, uh, both in equities and, and, in, and in credit, especially, high, especially investment grade credit. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to discount that this is a reality, again, I'm, I'm not interested in the conversation about whether or not this is a good idea. Uh, like that conversation is, is not really relevant. But the only thing that is relevant is this is how the Fed is acting. And is that action going to have an impact on asset prices? And our opinion here is very strongly that it will and that it will continue to do so. We think they've showed their hand. Uh, we think that there is, you know, this is as, as explicit and as close to an explicit um, you know, put as we've seen with respect to how, how, how central banks are acting. Um, and whether or not any, any individual person thinks that's a good or a bad idea, I don't much care about it. And I'm, I'm not sure anybody should. It's, this, this is how the Fed is acting right now. And so it's our job to understand that and, and act in accordance. So Scott, maybe let's let's pivot for just a second and, and think about this from a financial planning context. Uh, I, I think generally speaking, especially for those folks that are, are planning with clients that are accumulating assets, I, I think this is a very important point to, to keep in kind of in the back of your head that if you do have the, the Federal Reserve really in, in some cases serving as, as this backstop from a market perspective, that uh, would it be fair to say an overly conservative approach can really prove detrimental for somebody that's a longer term investor uh, that has the time to spend in the market. And that unfortunately, they, they may not be capturing gains when, that, when that's a, available in the marketplace. If that's the case from a planning standpoint, again, that, that can br prove really challenging to I would say implementing a successful financial plan. Is that fair? Absolutely. I mean, look, if 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 you if you have some time to recover, if you have some time to to ride out some some volatility, um, being exposed to, to to asset classes that are either implicitly or explicitly supported explicitly supported by by central bank activity is probably going to be a good idea. Um, and 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 so you know, and, and certainly uh, in financial planning, gains make all financial planning easier. And, and so, you know, exposing your client to gains, if they, if they have the ability to, to, to withstand some of the volatility, and, and not only ability, but time to withstand some of the volatility, uh, you know, we think is actually, from a financial planning standpoint, really the smartest way to go. Absolutely. And, and again, that, that's not to suggest that folks that do not have time on their side or they're in a different phase, if you will, they're, they're not growing their assets, maybe say they're protecting or taking income. Uh, those clients, the, the risk is different, right? But for the clients that do have time on their side, something like Fed support to, a, to an overall economy or a, a marketplace can actually prove uh, really helpful to achieving those goals. Scott, I, I know we've talked about the stimulus. Uh, I think this slide does a really good job of painting a picture that it's not just the U.S. We showed a slide on, on the Fed balance sheet, uh, but this chart on the right specifically really shows us just how much stimulus has put, been put into the global economy. Yeah, th th this is crazy. So uh, if, if, you, if, you know, if you look at the, you know, the, like, let's, let's start with the chart on the right. So the chart on the right is essentially money, liquidity into the system. Whether that comes from fiscal authorities, like governments spending money and doing stimulus checks, uh, or that is central banks buying assets. It's like money into the system. That's, that's, the, that's the thing on the right. Um, the thing on the left is rates. We'll talk about that in a second. But, but, the, but the, the chart on the right is, telling you, is showing you that on a global basis, um, just this year, there is $25 trillion coming into, uh, coming into the system in terms of stimulus, like 28% of the global GDP. That's an incredible amount of money coming into the system over a very short period of time. Um, and, and, and it's certainly the U.S. Uh, leading the way with this. 
the the thing that should you know so that's one thing that should jump out on the on you know jump jump off the page for you is just the sheer magnitude of this of the stimulus programs that have been enacted thus far. Um, and by the way, there's more to come. The other thing that should jump on off the page for you a little bit is China. Usually, China is one of the ones that are that are sort of leading the charge on the stimulus side, but they are actually a laggard in the and uh, through through this event. Um, so there is, you know, if there's more to come, China is certainly one that can add a lot more to the system uh, and 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 help boost prices again or boost activity again uh, through through their stimulus. You know, they've chosen thus far not to not to really act that aggressively or at least as aggressively as they have in the past. But what certainly wouldn't surprise us if they were to, uh, you know, to, to, to change that tune if things turned, you know, took a, took a turn for the worse uh, and and impacts, uh, you know, economies in, in far more, uh, you know, far more than they have thus far. The, you know, when we if we if we take a look at the chart on the left, so the, so the chart on the left is is monetary policy or is rates. So think of like a global Fed funds, um, and that you know that 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 is depicted with this this kind of dotted purple line, and it, it's an inverted uh, you know it's an inverted line. So when it, when that purple line is going higher. That's actually rate cuts, right? So when you know this is this is what this is saying is that the global you know from a global standpoint, global monetary authorities, global central banks have cut rates on the order of 150 basis points, 125, 150 basis points over the last uh, you know over the last six to nine months. That's awesome. That's great. You know what's not awesome about it though? It takes a while for that stuff to actually get in the economy. So the the you know the rate cuts that have that have already happened haven't really even impacted the economy very much yet. That should tell you that there's a massive tailwind of rate cuts coming behind this economy over the next over the next six to twelve months. That combined with the fiscal stimulus that we've seen thus far, that really hasn't you know is impacted asset markets, but it really hasn't impacted the economy a ton yet. Um, you know, all of these things are tailwinds over, over the next six to twelve months. And if we do get some sort of pharmacological development that makes this virus uh, either be much more manageable or go away, um, that stimulus is still in the pipeline. It is still coming. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the really positive right tail exposure that nobody is talking about right now is if we do get that pharmacological development that makes this thing okay, if it's a vaccine or treatment or whatever it is, that, that stimulus is there. It's coming. And it is going to boost things incredibly uh, with, 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 with that. If we don't get anything happening with, with, a, with you know, from a, pharm from a pharmacy standpoint, then, you know, the, then this stimulus will be needed. But if we do get that, that, that vaccine development or anything else out, out there in the future, this, you know, that plus this added stimulus is going to really put a rocket booster underneath the economy and underneath markets over the next 12 months. So, Scott, we've talked about kind of the combination of liquidity injections and, and falling interest rates. We talked about from a planning perspective how that can be maybe supportive for folks that are growing assets. Again, so the, maybe the Fed supporting the, the equity markets. That helps somebody who's got 20, 30 years in the marketplace to, to grow assets. Let's let's flip that though, and, and think about those clients that are taking distributions. Uh, you mentioned the fact that let's say interest rates are on the floor. You're in a, a zero interest rate environment. What is what does financial planning look like there? It, it has to create a challenging environment for those investors seeking income. Uh, the inability maybe to generate meaningful income from fixed income securities that have historically uh, reduced volatility for those distribution clients. It is something that uh, I think it's fair to say that financial planners are, are absolutely going to have to grapple with that and, and understand how to take advantage of maybe risky assets if and when it makes sense from a distribution portfolio. Is that is that accurate to say that? Yeah. Look, you can't spend volatility. Uh, you know, like volatility is not something you can spend. So, so, so reducing volatility for a retirement portfolio isn't necessarily the primary goal. Uh, the primary goal is to have as have, have a portfolio that's a, that supports the level of spending um, that your client wants. I don't think that's you know that's that's fairly obvious, but sometimes we forget it. Um, and and so planning in a in a zero rate world, what does retirement planning look like with with uh, ten year you know, ten year rates you know under one percent? Um, and by the way, they're going to be under one percent for a, for years. You know, these things are not moving off of you know off of where where they are right now for for years to come. Um, it, it could be a very long time before we see meaningfully higher interest rates. Um, just think about the level of debt right now in, in global economies and, and, and how easy it would be to support materially higher rates from here, just, just from that standpoint. Um, so if we do get, uh, you know, if, if an investment grade port, uh, bond portfolio, portfolio gets you, you know, one to one and a half percent total return over the next five to 10 years, which is not an unreasonable expectation. Um, is that, is that, is that, will that support a spending profile that your clients want uh, without running out of money? We would say probably not. 
Uh, you know, like we think that the retirement planning uh, solution needs to evolve and needs to adapt to the environment that we find ourselves in now. Because, we, because the environment that we find ourselves in now is one where, where a bond portfolio is the most risky thing you can do in retirement. So you have to find a different solution. Uh, whether that involves insurance products or, or managed money or managed money solutions that have a more of an equity bent to them, uh, you know, some, it's got to be something, but it can't be a bond portfolio. Yeah, it's got, I think that's a, a great point you bring up there at the end is the incorporation of, of other types of, of financial products. I, I think we would be uh, in favor of, of looking outside of maybe the traditional realm of purely using uh, stocks and bonds, that, that there are absolutely other avenues um, where, where you can incorporate that with a managed money solution, maybe that does have a little bit more of an equity bias because of what you just talked about uh, from a, a challenging environment for bonds, but incorporating a managed money solution with something like an insurance product, uh, maybe that's the solution going forward. I, I don't know that we know that from a crystal ball perspective today, but I, I think this idea of understanding that it's going to look different is, is really important. I think the last thing that we want to talk about when we think back to those four points is, is the election. Um, and and I, I think that's probably something that's on everybody's mind um, as that gets more and more in the news cycle. Uh, you, you start to hear about what the races are shaping up like probably in, in individual states or for that matter uh, across the country. Scott, we've got a little bit of information here on maybe where, uh, where markets would view uh, this race today. Um, but talk us through that, but also talk us through this, this comment at the, the, the header here at the top that uh, it's not even August. So we haven't even, we're, we're still four months out almost from the election. So why is that important to understand too? Yeah. So let, let, let me describe what the chart's saying first, and then we'll, we'll talk about our interpretation of it right now uh, in, in a second. So the, the red and green bars are is, is the betting market's uh, prediction for who's going to win. When it's green is Trump, when it's red is Biden. Um, so right now it's fairly fairly solidly on on, on Biden's side, you know about about 60 40. Um, the the yellow line uh, is is the, is the betting market's prediction for which party is going to control the Senate. When it's above zero, they're saying Republicans Republicans will control the Senate. When it's below zero, they're saying Democrats will control the Senate. So the interpretation right now, from at least betting markets, and this is consistent with all the polling kind of the real clear politics average of polling uh, sites, is uh, is the Democratic sweep is the base case, um, and Frankly, it's not close, but it's July. It's not August yet. And, and in the United States, we don't hold elections in July. Now we hold elections in November. Um, and, and, and so, you know, to think that this is sort of a foregone conclusion, we think is a little bit silly. Um, you, we, we don't really think right now that the campaign is going to really start until the campaigning really starts. That is until both candidates are out talking, doing debates, uh, really engaging a lot. Um, you know, right now is sort of a one-sided uh, political spectrum. We have Trump out uh, speaking and doing a lot of things uh, very publicly, as he always has done. Um, we have not heard tons from from, uh, from Vice President Biden yet, but that time is going to come. You know, the first presidential debate is September 29th. Uh, it seems far off, but it's really not all that far off. Uh, and so, you know, to, to, to think this is this is the, the sort of the foregone conclusion for how things are going to go, we think is a little bit mistaken, a little bit early. Um, you know, the, the, just because the election is still several months away, and a lot can and certainly will happen between now and then. Um, Market-wise, though, if this were to come to pass, you know, if, if, you know, if, it, if it is a, a democratic wave, we don't think that's particularly good for risk assets. Um, you know, it, 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 you know if, if it was a split decision, if it was, you know, if it was Biden in the presidency and Republicans uh, hold on to the Senate, uh, or, if, or if Trump uh, sweeps through, um, then we think that, uh, that, you know, that, would, that would be a more positive thing for risk markets. That's counter to what you what you might have been hearing from from some of the large research houses uh, on Wall Street that, that think a democratic sweep wouldn't be uh, you know neutral to net positive for risk markets. We think that is folly. Um, we do not agree with that at all. We don't. We totally disagree with the underlying premise that it would be more moderate in this governing um, because in crises uh, you don't tend to go more moderate. In crises you tend to go more extreme. That is the history of U.S. politics. Uh, because if it goes wrong, you can always blame the crisis. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't we don't think that, that, a, that a democratic sweep would end up being a more moderate type of approach. We'd, we'd actually think it would be a little bit more extreme type of approach, which just from a financial market standpoint uh, would provide more headwinds than tailwinds likely. Yeah, Scott, uh, I think what I what I hear you say is there's uh, from where we sit today, uh, there's absolutely still a lot of uncertainty around the election. And there's so much more information that is yet to come. Uh, I, I think the, the challenge, right, from a planning perspective is, 
when, when an advisor is, is with a client, how do we interpret some of that uncertainty? And, and I think that's where we would focus more on kind of what we call that protect stage. Clients focused on preservation of wealth. Uh, if you're looking for some way to add, uh, I guess, reduce that, uh, that reduce that uncertainty across that portfolio, uh, the, the way to do that in, in our goals-based framework is to put that client into that protect or, or risk mitigation type of portfolio. And, and that's important if you think about, again, if you think about the goals that that, cl that client is looking for, uh, really this idea of helping to mitigate loss. That, that's what those types of strategies are designed for. And, and the ability to do that in the face of uncertainty is extremely important. Um, and, and we think that's something that obviously there will be uh, newsworthy items that, that come and go. Uh, but for clients that maybe don't have time on their side and they need to preserve the, the wealth that they have accumulated, I think that's where it's really important to think about that risk mitigation component that risk mitigation objective uh, that a client faces as, as they head through that investment journey. So Scott, really appreciate kind of all your, your uh, knowledge and information that you shared with us today. I think we can boil it down to a few main points here uh, as we talk about kind of that resilient consumer, uh, the fact that we have seen a strong bounce off that March bottom. We talked about the stimulus, just the magnitude and speed, the fact that there's probably even still more to come. Uh, we talked about the election uh, in the fact that you, you don't really expect all of the information to be out even for a couple more months. Uh, those three from a market perspective, I, I think are extremely important to, to understand, but I would say that the, the fourth bullet down there at the bottom is probably the most important from a, a planning perspective. And, it, and it's this idea of understanding the interaction between these market headlines that we just talked about and how that affects a client's portfolio and, and the risks associated therein in order to keep a, a client on track in regards to their financial plan. Uh, I would kind of close with this from a, a, a planning perspective is each client goes through an investment journey. Uh, and in doing so, they shift from accumulating assets to preserving or protecting assets and then at some point, generally speaking, clients will need to take distributions or take income off those assets. And understanding the risks and how those change throughout those three phases is extremely important for a financial planner. Uh, to understand that a, a client that has time on their side from an accumulation perspective maybe can take a little bit more risk. You have to understand the volatility uh, that will be present in a portfolio. You wanna make sure that you're being compensated from a portfolio perspective uh, for the, the amount of volatility that you're taking on. Uh, but again, you've got time on your side. And, and as we talked about this idea of Fed stimulus for clients that have time on their side, that really is, is a boost or a benefit uh, to somebody who's got 15, 20, 25 years to spend growing assets. Uh, we talked about preservation. Again, it's the client who's, who's maybe worried about loss. They need to protect a certain dollar amount in order to retire. And, and I think that's extremely important to realize what market events have the possibility of putting that, that dollar amount or that objective in jeopardy. Um, and, and to understand, hey, how do I, from a portfolio selection, from a financial planning perspective, choose the, the product or set of products, as, as we mentioned earlier, the, the combination maybe of different types of products, to really help solve for that risk in that stage, which as, as we talked about is, is the risk of, of loss. And then finally, the longevity component. Uh, we talked about this idea of financial planning in a zero rate environment. Uh, I think it's extremely important uh, from, a, from a planning perspective to understand that uh, planning for retirement income today is not going to look probably anything like uh, it looked 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the environment that we're in today is very different. I think we would all agree with that. Uh, but understanding the interaction between the different types of assets, the different types of financial products, and how those fit into a financial plan really allows for really more consistent portfolios and allows for the ability to stick to a financial plan and, and hopefully stay on track. Uh, so with that, John, I will turn it back to you because I think you've got some pretty interesting enhancements about how those, this idea of goals-based 
uh, investments, how, how that fits into some of the technology that we've really rolled out over the last month or so. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Scott. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we have goals-based guidance tools, and we have many, many of our advisors that use them on a daily basis. And I'm actually excited to make uh, two announcements. One is we recently rolled out what we call the Research Lab. So both you and, uh, and Scott were talking a lot about uh, the preservation stage. And the research lab allows an advisor to visualize and experience different risk mitigation strategies under different market scenarios. So under COVID scenario, how would low vol, um, how would that behave? How would, how would a de-risking algorithm behave? It's a very, very powerful simulator something that I urge everyone to take a look at, um, and, uh, and we've gotten some pretty good feedback about it. The second thing that we've done recently is uh, we've rolled out an enhanced resource center. So think about our resource center as like the location for brochures, commentary, performance, white papers, any, any of the, the thought leadership that comes from Horizon. Uh, we recently rolled out a newly improved resource center. Uh, it's easy to navigate, you know, even for a guy like me, it's easy to navigate. And, um, and we still have some things coming soon. So uh, very excited to, um, to at least tease you a little bit with goals-based risk scoring. That's something that's new that you'll be hearing about from us, as well as a behavioral risk assessment, uh, which we think is, uh, is really, really interesting, and we think it's going to help your clients. So I'm happy to make those announcements. Again, thank you to everyone that has joined the call. Um, we, as always, look forward to, to talking with you. Please feel free to reach out to us at 866-371-2399 or info at horizoninvestments.com. Again, grateful that you joined the call and grateful for your partnership. Everybody have a great day.